Hey all you YouTube viewers out there, welcome back to another episode of Fleet Yard's Mission Briefing. Now, Mission Briefing style is basically done like this. We take a ship from any sci-fi sci franchise and uh, we look at it. We don't really have a lot of facts on it. We give you a few general breakdowns, a few statistics, but we just kind of look at it and discuss different aspects of it, uh, what we think they are if we don't know, or just talk about other points we do know. Now, full episodes on these ships will be available down the road if we hit our Patreon goals. So if you can, check on, check it out. Head on over to Patreon.com. Link that's, is in the description. That's uh, only $1,000 to get full, pay, uh, yes. full fleet odds, and we're pretty close. So take a look and help us out. Anyways... I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Captain Foley. And I am Commander Cockings. Back from back from Canada. This is literally the day after I flew back on a very long journey. So this is this is jet lag, Sam. Absolutely up to date, guys. We filmed this on Sunday as soon as I got back. And today's episode is also a little bit special, guys, because we have a special guest joining us for our very first Fleet Yards mission briefing with a special guest. Yes. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, it does. Today we have uh, Daniel from over at Space Dock uh, yes. joining us today. And uh, Samuel, why is Daniel joining us? Well, if you don't know, his channel looks at all... I mean, we look at Star Trek. He looks at everything from everything, um, and all the detail, all canonical, nice, short, very well-made videos. You know, we're friends with Daniel. He likes us. He's been on Trek Yards. We've been on his podcast. Um, and they, they, they're doing an Aurora Class episode today as well. So we thought we'd sort of mo viral marketing both at the same time sort of thing. Uh, and so, you know, he'll be linking to this video. We can find out his discussion. Um, so we're going to do what we think and then bring him on right at the end for sort of third part so it uh, should be fun. So what are we doing today? Because I don't know. Well, um, and again, sometimes you'll see down later in the line, we might use real models, we'll see. But this is a fan model of the Stargate Ancient or Lantian Aurora class battleship. From Stargate cool. Atlantis. <laughs> and I personally obviously love Stargate, you guys know that. Uh, Atlantis is my favorite, and this was introduced in Atlantis. But as we always do, Stuart, first reaction from seeing this design, what do you think? Pretty cool design. I like it. It looks like a battleship style ship, like modern day battleship kind of thing. A lot of guns visible. Um, just the thickness of it. I don't know. It just, mm. I just see battleship when I see this. So, nice. Yeah, I think it's cool. Now, as we also always ask, and we're going to show you in a minute because the second picture will be scale. But what do you think the scale is of the ship based on what you see? Again, compared to Star Trek, because we're, we're a Star Trek channel. But what do you think scale wise for the ship? Hmm. Probably size of Enterprise D, maybe, lengthwise. Okay. Um, okay. I can't see it being much bigger than that. Okay. And by I, the look um, on your face, I'm probably wrong, but that's okay. Yes, so as we've learned, Star Trek is a smaller scaled fleet. But let me give you some quick background on this ship. So this is an ancient warship. Every one we see, at least the ancient versions, are 10,000 years old. So they're already antiques because that's when the ancients left Tim Horton's product placement. When they left uh, the galaxy, or at least uh, ascended, this ship was meant to be the pinnacle of ancient battleship technology. There's a cruiser, there's a frigate. This is the biggest and best ship. It's armed with shields, pulse cannons, as you can see, but also drone weapons, which you might remember. Have you seen Stargate Atlantis much? Um, I think you have a little bit. I've seen a f quite a few of them. It's one of my, my one of my favorite Stargates. So, had you got to this ship yet? No, I haven't seen this ship. Okay. The first time you see it is an episode called Aurora, funny enough, and they, they built the ship and they also destroyed it because it's a sort of damaged version. Um, and it was quite a big deal. But then, a few episodes later, you get a they find a ship called the Hippocalcus, for Calcus, but they name it the Orion. And for us as fans, finding a ship like this was a huge deal because, I mean, this is the best of the best in terms of ancient tech. And it's had drones, it's had... You know, even though it was damaged, it was a massive deal to find this ship. It doesn't last too long, because that would be unfair, because it's a very powerful ship, but it's a very, very strong one. You know, the drone weapons, you might know from, remember from Atlantis, they can pass through shields. Um, although the Wraith don't use shields, but in any other conflict they can. So you take this against Star Trek ships, and this will easily rip through, I mean, any shielding. So, you know, get one dr drone, drone to the bridge, one drone to the engines. I mean, you're looking at massive destruction. So it's a very powerful style of ship, but also shields are incredibly effective when fully charged. Very, very quick hyperspace, which cannot be modified to be intergalactic hyperspace, but has the potential to go between galaxies. Um, also has, you know, all sorts of stuff. It's, it, they didn't go into that much depth, but it certainly is. <laughs> when they found it, considered one, the, if not the top thing in the galaxy, one of the top. And you compare it to Wraith ships, the reason Wraith won the war in Atlantis is because they had bigger numbers and they can keep growing more ships. So obviously you you spent, you know, you spent 30 Hive ships, which are also huge against this ship. It still can't compete. 
and they weren't building these at the same rate because you just can't physically build things at the same rate. So it's kind of relative, but this is this is one of those big big ships. And like I say, for me personally, it was like, oh my god. Um, and just to see an ancient ship, we saw pole jumps before Atlantis, but an actual ancient ship was really interesting. Um, so yeah, that, that's the short history of this ship. Any questions before we go on to scale? <laughs> so the, you said the drones go through any energy shielding at all? That's that's how they're designed, yeah. I find that hard to believe because different energy shielding would be different. Would they, though? different ways and things. Would they, though? I mean, it's all based on just a shield of energy. And if, 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 the, if the drone is, is designed to just dissipate energy, I don't know exactly how it works, but just to go through energy, the modulation shouldn't necessarily matter. Because it's all it's designed for. And it's a little explosive yield, but obviously they're so advanced that that much you know, physical matter is a big explosion. Because they're not designed for a single hit. It's designed to be a, a, a set of drones. So the, the, mo the whole drone is through shields. And it's a little explosion. If you send 50 into, you know, into the hull, like we saw in uh, Beyond, pummeling a hull, you're going to cause massive hit, massive destruction with ne not necessarily a hugely powerful weapon. Um, Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure tr Trek heads could probably maybe modulate against it, but I'm, I guarantee they could re-modulate against it. I mean, these are very advanced races. I mean, it's the most advanced race in all Stargate history. Besides the Asgard, but that's a whole separate hot separate thing. But, Stuart, I can tell you're eagerly awaiting to learn about its scale. And I remember this is a fan model, but I did, mo I did base this scale off the most popular fan scale chart out there. Um, we'll see if that changes later on down the line. But, Stuart, go to the next picture. Oh. It's a little bit bigger than the Galaxy class. <laughs> a little bit. A little bit. It's a little bit ridiculously big. It is very big. It is meant to be the biggest ship. I mean, the, the, the cruiser's quite a lot smaller, um, and then the frigate's quite a lot smaller than that. So this is meant to be that, because <clears throat> these are also intergalactic ships. So they have like rooms and levels of stasis pods, so that the, so the fleet, so that the pilots can you know go a long way. So it's a very versatile ship. I, I would assume these are like you know colonies in space as well. My assumption for this ship is that it's it's not only shielded but heavily armored. So in fact, the hull mm, so. is multiple, like potentially meters and meters thick. Um, so you're probably looking at, you know, this ship was designed to be the ultimate. So I'm assuming they'd do both. Um, now, if you go back to the first picture for a second, I'll show you the bridges and give you a sense because that might help you work out scale. And again, I I, know, I think it's a bit oversized personally, because if you look at the if if you see those eight cannons. Mm -hmm. that dome thing next to it, that's the bridge. And those are big pane windows. I mean, the bridge is like, you know, it's almost like, it's very, very tall. It's a huge size bridge. See. Um, <clears throat> easily bigger than the D, bigger than, probably bigger than um, Ops that's, from DS9. You know? That's interesting though, because had I had noticed that when I you asked me for the scaling first time, I would have said it would be a lot smaller based on those windows. Even that's smaller than what I initially said. That's interesting. Because that would be those are damn big windows then. Now you've got to remember again that if this ship has ultra powerful shields, ultra powerful hull, if no one can get through it, why wouldn't you have a big, you know, a dome that to see out and to do things? I mean, if if, if you can't if you can't be damaged, then just have this big bridge. Not necessarily the safest. If you, I mean, again, the wraith come out of nowhere. No one in the galaxy could but, even challenge them remotely. You know. Then again, you said you know it could be like meters of shielding. Well. If then shoot a missile at the dome, and boom, done, right through the dome, and you're into in the heart of the ship. They do do that. Oh well, there you go. And it doesn't go well for everybody. <laughs> nice. Yes, that's a, certainly a flaw. But they've got a secondary command center, I think tertiary somewhere in the hull. So yeah, but uh, I'm sure I'm sure armor plating comes down. I always say I know I said about multiple bridge windows, but I mean it makes sense. But um, let's go on to the next picture. The side scale. Now, obviously, I compared the Der the Derelicts here to give you a sense of scale. So, the last picture you mm. saw, the, Der the Derelicts is hugely wide, and this it's it's sort of deeper, but obviously it's got that big scale in the middle. Uh, you know, it's hollow. But certainly, if this was in the Trek universe, it would certainly be a you know sort of ship. Based on the size, I would say this could possibly be like a colony ship. You got a bunch of people you're taking to a new colony, like a lot of people. <laughs> Um, a lot of room here, so is it a battleship or is it? I guess it would be, based on what you said, right? It's definitely a battleship. Yes, I mean it's it's a, it's a warship. That's its default thing. But like I say, it is. It seems very big for that. That's all. Well, do you want your battleships and your warships to be huge and intimidating, 
or do you want them to be small and maneuverable so that they can kick the crap out of another fleet? I think what this compares to is the Dominion with their ginormous battleships, which are even bigger than the Derodex. You know, that is their biggest ship, and it is a huge. It's half, you know, over half the size of this ship. Then you've got the smaller cruisers, which are half the size, but not a third of the size of that. Then the more smaller bug ships. So, I mean, I think mm. this is their... I mean, we have no idea how many there were. You know, we found two... And the Asurans, the had a whole load. But that's a different situation. So there might only be like three of these, to be fair. They might be. I mean, look at the Atlantis City, also huge. It's a spaceship, it's a colony, yeah. whatever. Um, so the, the function of these things is probably going to be multi multi-purpose. But I, ne I never thought it was this big, personally, either. To be, to be fair. But this is, again, based on a scale chart, a, very, a famous one online that you can find. Yeah. I think it's smaller, personally. I would... I think you could... I think you could retroact... I think you could, based on the Trek scale, I think you could work out... If we found blueprints of the bridge, which I think should be available from prop works or whatever... And work out exactly how many meters it is. I think you could base that exactly on the scale of the ship. So I think we could backward engineer the scale. That's a whole other episode, guys. One question I do have from the side there. It looks like there's almost a separation point. Hmm. Kind of just past the halfway mark. Does it separate? Is that a feature you've seen or heard of? Or They didn't survive long enough to really know any features beyond the obvious. <laughs> uh, I don't know. It's got those like wing attachments, too. It yeah. looks like it could be a more maneuverable kind of ship that comes on the back. That's interesting. Yeah, like the like the the secondary hull in the galaxy, like the main engine part yeah, comes off. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. That, I mean that's gonna be interesting. All right. So the next picture is a shot of it from the back, ish. They're not very big engines for the size of their ship. But again, for the ships, they're huge and they're still big engines. Well, yes, true. So, a lot of detail. I do love this model. It's not the official one, but it might as well be because it's beautifully detailed. I like the asymmetry of it with this thing out the side. Yeah. That really is a nice touch. Does that does that make you think maybe that pod is retractable and they can put different pods there? Or on the other side as well? Could be, but looking at the, the attachment points, I don't think that looks very practical for that. And again, fan model, so maybe they were connectable oh, in the yeah. full version. Um, but I think yeah, that'd, that'd, be certainly, be that'd certainly be a cool feature, especially if that engine module can come out, then maybe this is the you know, the intergalactic hyperspace portion, those two glowing blue bits are the standard impulse, and then there might be engines on the other side as well, so maybe it's all, like, mix and match. Maybe they didn't build this one big ship. This is the biggest ship because it was the mix and match ship, maybe. Yeah, I think any, any kind of functionality that way with ships with plug-and-play designs I think always makes sense, and I always love when they do that. Let's go to the next picture, a uh, similar shot but from reverse. You can see um, all the uh, cannons on the side of the hull. There's one, two, three, f uh, there's six. Yeah, the six on the bottom of each side and six on the top. So a lot of pulse disruptor cannons already. Um, mm. Lots of other nerdies and things. But again, it, it's. I suppose that's all the advanced stuff you need, and then the drones do everything else. So it's kind of a pretty meaty warship. But also, again, you could say. Very much, you know, side combat. If uh, they can't obviously rotate, you know, the middle ones can't rotate aft because they'll shoot the other ones. So obviously, there's, there is a limited firing arc. So drones make up for that, but is um, I guess limited in that respect. But uh, yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, one thing I, no, I know it's very interesting. It's right above those dro uh, those guns on the back, facing backwards. It looks like an engine. Yeah. So is that a supplemental engine to complement the ones on the back, or it, or? Does it separate right there, like I said, and those are engines for powering that forward part? Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. I mean, if it's this advanced, why wouldn't you have the engines internal in the in the separation point? You know, have a common impulse there. We know it's an asymmetrical ship, so it doesn't, have, it doesn't need to have symmetrical engines, does it? No. Okay, well, so let's go on to the next picture, and this is a shot from the bottom, from the front, from the... Yes. Um, okay. What are those things at the front? Are those all guns, or are they sensor equipment? See, that portion I never even really registered when I was watching it, because you don't even see it really well. And it's kind of like an extra pod on the bottom, because you can tell what the main geometry they're just sort of stuck on. I don't know. What do you What do you think it is? Could be anything. <laughs> it really could. <laughs> um, I haven't seen drone launchers on here yet, but I think I know where they might be. I, I As far as I remember, they are just little... Um, circular tubes in the middle of the hull. It's very much in that central bit in between the two cannons, between the uh, two rows of cannons. There's just yeah. There's just bays. Just, uh, the doors open and they just all fling out. That's kind of what I thought it might be, so... Yeah. But yeah, I wouldn't say they're drone launchers or anything, but I think... 
communications equipment. But then again, you got the you got the antennas and stuff on that pod at the side on the other side, sure. uh, which speaks more to communications equipment. So maybe sensor equipment, maybe yeah. some kind of weapon. Uh, at least two. The ones on the outside look like weapons. Oh, maybe perhaps. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. And then the middle maybe ones they are targeting are, scanners. Maybe they help form the hyperspace. Hmm? You know, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. All right, so let's go on to the next picture. Uh, this is a great shot of it from the front, actually. I like the, I like the coloring on it, and I do like the whole detail. It's not too much, and it looks like everything does have, serve a, f a, pump, a purpose. Speaking of which, um, looks like there's eight little cylinder cylindrical tube hatches. I think are the, you think those are the drone drone launchers there. Why were you right looking in, at for this? Right in front of the uh, four guns. There's like little t hatches that are like. They stick out. They're not really hatches, but uh, are they? There's this neck part. Are they on either side of the neck part, or are they these circles with big rectangle tubes, uh, rectangle elements? Yeah, there's for? there's one rectangle with four things on each one. Okay, I th I think those might be the drone launchers. That would make sense. It's like a submarine then. That's interesting. I could buy that. Uh, I thought it was. I thought it was the two internal circles, but I I would rather have it be launched from multiple areas personally. So I think that makes more sense. Hmm. Hmm. And I'm thinking that uh, part in between the cannons could be the shuttle bay or the pole jumper bay. It's not necessarily the best location for it, but <laughs> but I mean you would probably need a shuttle bay somewhere. Yeah, I would think so. Especially if it just recesses, like if it's a single pad like the Enterprise, and then recesses down rather than it be a hangar. It's just a pad, and then internally it's a hangar. Oh, interesting. I want I want to talk about the uh, the side detail for a sec, the the asymmetrical. As far as I know, um, from reading something else, that's the long-range sensor. Mm -hmm. um, and you, and you, uh, there's a big deal with subspace in this universe. You can transmit data over subspace. You can do uh, communications. So I, I would assume that would be the big, you know, subspace. Obviously, you're just limited um, in in distance. So maybe that can communicate with something across the galaxy. You know, because all you need is just a big transmitter, don't you? And I guess yeah. a receiver on the other end. Uh, yeah. Do you think any of those um, devices would be responsible for creating the? Fat, the FTL kind of thing they got? Well, that's a difficult one because all we ever see... Obviously, every alien race treats how they design a ship differently. So it's, so we can't assume because this ship hasn't got a deflector, say, it can't go into warp. So because this ship hasn't got this, it can't go into FTL. We have hyperspace in Stargate. And the Deadless from Stargate, it has these little four um, engines at the back which blast and it goes into hyperspace. I don't know if it's if that's... I don't know which bit is actually creating the, the field, uh, creating the, the, the hole, I suppose, to go into. So it's kind of difficult to say. I would assume, because there are lots of different, um, and you, you, you know, I'm sure we'll look, we'll look at the Deadless at a point, you know, there's lots of different antennas. I'm sure they also might help to create that field. So these are probably somewhere. But we'll look at the engines in a minute, and you can tell which are the hyperspace compared to the uh, sublight. Okay. Um, so the next picture is, as I said, the aft. Mm. And you've got these big engines and small engines, and as far as I'm aware, the uh, the eight, I suppose, four on each side, and the, and the three small ones, they're all the uh, FTL, and then the three internal ones are the sublight. Hmm. That would make sense to me. Yeah, and they also look very similar to the uh, engine detail on the Deadless, which is quite interesting. But yeah, what do you think about, I mean, again, the scaling of the ship, what do you think about the engine design, even? It just seems rather small. A lot of times when we see other sci-fi franchises, the big ships like this, they have really big engines on the back. This seems a lot smaller than, than those, but I like it. I actually really like that. I think that fits this. And if you look really, really carefully, you can see we break for nobody bumper sticker right there. I don't know. Maybe this is Spaceball 1. I mean, it, it, it yes, it probably is. Um, although, having looked at the show, I don't remember seeing those lower, smaller engines on. Only the big four on either side. So my uh, my guess would be based on that, that maybe those four are the hyperspace, or even they're the sublight, potentially, and then the bottom seven are FDL. Because, um, like I said, it's a very, very advanced FDL drive. Yeah. And, but also, if, if, if it's not providing physical thrust, then you don't necessarily need the, them to be big. It could be either way, you know. I, I really would love the design of the Aurora class to come on the show and talk about it because I, I, so many questions. I don't know how much they thought about the ship, but I would love to hear more about it. Honestly, yeah, I would love to hear a lot of the designers for really these different franchises talk about their designs. Next picture. 
He's the guns. Oh, nice. That's a big gun, Stuart. What do you think? <laughs> they're, they're huge. And like I said, they're very battle uh, battleship-like. Uh, yes. <laughs> like big swivelable turrets, which is cool. Very Battlestar as well. Battlestar Galactica. Yeah. But like you said, it... the, the, the middle ones do have kind of a limited firing arcs, which is not really a great... They should have kind of been staggered, I think, placed a little bit differently, okay. even even stepped, because that way you can get more coverage of each gun. Yeah, that's interesting. Although it's worth noting these guns are next to the bridge, I suppose, and then the other set are on the bottom of the of the, of that part of the ship, so they are differently placed. But if you look at each gun, you call it a, you know, a, a disruptor cannon or plasma turret. Well, there's four batteries each one, so I mean you're looking at four times four times two. And then times two again. That's a lot of disruptor or plasma or pulse, whatever being fired. I mean, in terms of pulse defense or even just primary attack, I mean, that's a lot of weapons that they should should and could be able to fire. I know these ships have huge power generators, and if they're given a ZPM, even more. So, uh, you know, just from that, and you can imagine if they, especially if they do it like a turn maneuver, and all batteries can then fire. I mean, you can see why they were pretty effective uh, warships. I mean, even just that many. You know, why have just single battery? Just have Multiple guns. It's crazy. I'm just wondering the maneuverability on a ship this big. Because, I don't know, I, I would want my warships to be a little bit smaller and a little bit more maneuverable. Because I yeah. can't see big big bulking things. Even in space, I can't see them moving super well, fast. This could easily be, though, the equivalent of the Dreadnought. You know, the fleet command ship, the fleet support ship. Just because we see it as the warship doesn't mean it's not the fleet control ship. That could explain the big, uh, the big. Uh, we should go to the next picture, um, close up on that zone. That could be the fleet control area. That could be signaling to all different ships. Maybe mm. even you know, signaling power wirelessly to other parts of you know the fleet. Maybe you know, maybe even controlling drone ships if they use some. You know, that's very interesting. Would that help your scaling? If this was, you know, maybe there's five of these and they reach the, the dreadnought of the fleet, the the control fleet, and then the smaller ships are the primary fleet. Yeah, I think that would make a little bit more sense for me. Uh, these ones kind of sit back and and even turn sideways. They can use the guns yeah. for long range, yeah. take off targets. Well, yeah. yeah. Oh, that also help with the scaling issue because then you'd want to armor the fleet ship even more, wouldn't you? You'd want to make sure this ship can survive, you know? Yeah, yeah. One interesting thing I want to point out, if you look at the uh, this this area of the ship underneath those pointy bits there looks like to be a you know a hatch that you know opens up that could be a possible forward drone launcher that's similar to how they do it on Atlantis anyway big drones then yeah well or just launching 500 at a time I mean you know yeah because if you look at the you know, end of SG-1 season 8 you know, they fire hundreds if not thousands of drones you know? so the idea is they just build lots of small things and they can just rip they, they don't take prisoners really when you're going to go attack the Wraith, they just... A lot of drones. Nice. You need, you need a lot of ammo. <laughs> yeah. A lot of ammo. Yeah. Next picture is a close-up of, I guess, the back section of the ship. Yep. I like those fins. I don't know why. I just think they're a nice touch. But what do they do? They're on, like, hydraulics, so they must they move. Are. Well... Mm -hmm. I would I think know. additional shielding, but why would you have it move like that? I don't know. How, do they move it all in the show? Like when they go to in not not that I remember, not that I remember. <laughs> I don't know. They must serve a purpose. Yes, I will find out one day. It'll be fun to do, and you can see another set of of turrets, although smaller turrets on the back. Yes, which is kind of cool, and possible drone launchers. Those those two on either side, and possibly even a shuttle bay. Maybe. Well, I think that's probably like exhaust rather than. Another bay. Yeah, I would think so. And then the next picture is a really close up, close up on the front, or on the back of the fins, sorry. And you get to see again the cannons are definitely on hydraulics. Um, and the two impulse engines potentially at the top, one on the side. I mean, again, just, just nice close up details of everything. Uh, and the interesting thing about this back section is it's not a huge, huge bulk, which we see a lot in a lot of other ships from sci fi, where the big bulk is all just engines. This seems to be a lot smaller and more refined than. Uh, a lot of other uh, franchises, especially in relation to the rest of the ship. Usually, you got the engine section at the back, which is just one big section. You can tell it's all engines, and it's huge. Well, obviously, this, this does have a big engine section that we, we saw previously. I mean, obviously, if you look yeah, at the picture, but, 
before I mean, it is still a bigger but when you compare it to the rest of the ship it doesn't it doesn't scream full of engines it's got a nice shape to it it's it's not a lot bigger than the ship it's not right. i don't know i don't know what i'm trying to say but it's there's just more some, refined there's some elegance to it yes yeah well all the ships we've looked at use more chemical propulsion engines you know this is a very very advanced ship so form can follow form because the function already is there you know mm -hmm. maybe yeah uh, and the last picture is, of course, the first picture. Um, just a nice three-quarters view. Yeah, I wouldn't want to be looking down, you know, be on its bad side or anything, so... Uh, you can imagine being in a Defiant and thinking, Quantums, and you're like, yeah, Quantums won't help you here. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then I always ask, have I sort of converted you to this ship a little bit more from when we started? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this and the Daedalus she did a good job on. Um, so, yeah, I think yeah. Stargate Designs have a nice little... And again, this is Atlantean ancient design, but we've got some other great alien races from Stargate to look at. So I think, yeah, I think another one of those ones I really cared about. But without further ado, uh, let's let's bring on Daniel. Hey everybody, Daniel from Space Dog here. I've just finished my episode on the Aurora over on my channel. Jumping in here to discuss the ship with you guys. Well, welcome, because <laughs> I know nothing about it because I'm not a Stargate fan. But I, I do, but I want to know, we all know different things. But what's your thoughts on the Aurora class then, Daniel? Uh, I'm I'm a big fan of the ship. I've always been a big fan of the ship. Um, as for, from the moment I saw it, really, it's 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 such an interesting design because I I I picture uh, the guy who designed this had to have uh, he had a lot of weight on his shoulders because he was designing a, a ship that was the mm. definitive ship of a faction that had been built up and built up over years and years and was enormously important to the mythos of Stargate and and he had to design this ship for them. And honestly, I think if I'd have been in his position. I confess I would probably have done something like really alien looking and and uh I don't know I don't know if you guys have seen the trailer for the upcoming uh Chris Pratt film with mm. uh, I think it's called Passengers there's a mm. sort of helix shaped mm. yeah. wacky looking ship going Incredible that, looking. that's yeah. probably what I would have gone for but he was right not to do that that would have been a mistake because these guys are after all a spacefaring civilization like any other and they've accelerated to this point in technology but there's no reason why they wouldn't have a utilitarian, angular, sensible design like this. And and that's what he's gone for, and or he or she has gone for. And it really works. And and they've they've obviously embraced the idea of okay, how do the ancients fight? They fight with drones. So we've got this ship, this is basically a drone platform, it's an attack platform for drones. It's we've got if you look we look at the cutouts, the cutouts are semi-logical but still they, we see bays upon bays of drones stored in there mm -hmm. and it's got all these pulse cannons all over the place and under certain circumstances with the ZPMs etc like I mentioned in my episode you can use these to engage other ships and they work as an offensive weapon but for the most part they seem to be coupled with the shields keep us alive until we can get into a position to throw a lot of drones at them it's um, all of their warfare style is based on, like, or, or, that seems to be what they're trying to communicate and, here. And based on the size of the ship, you're going to be sending thousands, if not tens of thousands of drones, Absolutely. potentially. And we've seen how effective that is against the Wraith. I mean, you would think, you would think that in the war with the, the Wraith, even with maybe 20 Hive ships, this comes in 10,000 drones. You would, since it doesn't take that many to destroy one. Mm, yeah. But then again... Uh, one thing that I was trying to figure out when we were looking at the pictures is where exactly are the drone launchers on this thing? Uh, the drone launchers are across the the, uh, the dorsal bow, uh, but the the, door, the drones themselves are stored in one of the two side mounted pod bits. The, uh, the 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 smaller one, the larger pod is purportedly a sensor array, but on the opposite side there's a smaller protrusion that's okay. full of drones. Yeah, Very I'm cool. sure there's probably like multiple secondary tertiary. You know, I mean, we know they have some sort of we know we know they have rings. Theoretically, they have ring transporters, yeah. so they can just yeah. beam. I've never seen a certain ring rings, but uh, they probably do. Well, we're going to assume they're probably quite similar to the sort of uh, Ori style uh, white rings that we saw. I would assume they're more Gould because you wouldn't imagine the Gould would be able to alter them too much. They don't really understand the technology per se. Mm -hmm. Whereas the with the, with the Ori, I'd want to make a literal. We're standing against your design, therefore it makes something very yeah. purist and because it's meant to be magic. I, so I, I quite like the fact that the um, although I'm not sure if this is deliberate, but the original rings that the Gold use are very similar to what we ended up getting in the Seed ships and in Destiny, uh, in terms in terms of aesthetic. And I like the idea that the the Alterans, later Lantians, Ancients had various epochs of design style. We start out with the big Destiny-style pointed onk shape with the uh, 
with the rings, and then we move on to uh, the kind of flat city ship stuff, and then we move into the Atlantean style Aurora class, and and it feels like these guys have really been a lot around for a long time. Yeah. They've moved through all these different phases and styles, and it's it adds to the mythos a lot, I think. Now, do we do we know a crew complement on this, <laughs> or is that uh, not offhand? I know that it can be operated by one person, but they yeah, on... we. We see over a lot more than on that. On the Stargate wiki, it says 300 to 500 as crew. Mm. Oh, um, wow. It's yeah, perfect. which is... I mean, we if you go to the next picture, uh, which you always saw on the episode, there's a scale chart. I mean, this is the... Again, this is based on any scale charts out there, but I, I somewhat disagree with it per se, and there's probably... And I, know, I know that you have some alternate scale, which we'll talk about in a second, but I mean, you know, the Daedalus has a good-sized crew. The Enterprise-E is like 400 and something. The Econi is, you know, 300 uh, something. So having a 500 crew, I mean, it, it must be either very automated in terms of like so much of just machinery uh, we theorized in the episode that it's a lot of his armor like this ship is designed to be the, the fleet ship to go into a battle so it's got maybe even meters tens of meters of hull to go beyond yeah. the shields like this ship is well, going to last a battle doesn't necessarily have, help it in the in the episodes but design wise potentially i have a suggestion because you said there's lots of drones on board it's a lot of dro- drone storage is it possible that a lot of that internal space is actually factory facilities for c- c- producing drones like do they build That's... the drones kind of on site Ooh. Certainly plausible. Yeah. But you would assume, and that's a brilliant idea, Stuart. You'd assume Atlantis would have drone capacity, but the size of this ship, especially if it's a warship, we you know we saw we know the, the Aurora was very far out. We know it can be modified to intergalactic engines. You would need to have reconstru- you know, reconstruction facilities for drones, because if you're firing thousands, if you run out of thousands, that's his primary weapon gone, we assume. Yeah. So yeah, I mean that would make a lot of sense, in which case maybe you've got three hundred five hundred crew, but two hundred drone operators, drone drone controllers throughout the ship maybe it's you know this is skyscrapers worth of just this creates this sort of drone this creates another sort of drone i don't know maybe it's specialized things i mean mm. who knows i mean yeah. I, I also we assume they'd use pole jumper squadrons yeah there's a, there's a potential yeah. shuttle bay e- exit but again we never see this thing that's full potential either no, in the there, show there in a... bays. We, we do know that there are three launch bays oh, because laren says land in bay three in Ooh. uh in one of our episodes and there is information somewhere potentially from a fact file, so you know, saying it's puddle jumpers. But I mean, it probably would be puddle jumpers, wouldn't it? Yeah. So, in my episode, which a few people watching this may have just come from. Hopefully, I if give, not, oh, go watch it right now. <laughs> Thanks, guys. They come back. But I give a. Uh, I, I say that the sizes of the of these of variants of this ship range from three thousand to three thousand five hundred meters long, and that is because I will always quote whatever information is cons- is 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 publicized by the people that made the show and in this case that doesn't necessarily match up with the visual effects used in the show and honestly i mean there's either a happy medium or the visual effects are probably better to go with but you know the the the, uh the ship is not i mean you can say that it's two different variants we've got the orion and we've got the aurora that we see on the show and there are different scales for each of them announced and it's it seems like because the, the dimensions are the same, it's the same visually, and the implication is that they are the same ship, and there's the, like without any realistic dif- difference. And it's entirely possible that the discrepancy between these two lengths in the fact files is just a mistake. Mm. But that's what was published, and that's the way it goes as far as space docs concerned. But it is interesting to talk about because, like, I mean, Samuel's made these fantastic renders for this episode, and this is like extrapolated from. The size compared to all the things that we see in the uh, in the episodes, and it seems more logical, honest, to be perfectly honest. Like mm. it, it's supposed to be comparable to the Wraith Hive ships, not like bigger than or longer than, but but in that kind of playing field. Well, it's like, worth mentioning that the, the Roman Warbird is meant to be around thirteen hundred meters, so this would roughly equate to that sort of three thousand. Mm. So that's that's the officially scale. It's huge, you know. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And it should be huge. I mean, there's a shot of um, there's a shot of they use it twice actually. Once in reverse, where we see the Deadless class alongside the Aurora class above Lantia. Yeah. And they pan to the right, and it's like it's like a dead-on forward view of the Deadless, and then off to the right, and the entire three-quarters view of, and it's it's obviously miles bigger, like like so, so much bigger, and it 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 should be like this is this is a Lantian battleship. These guys are supposed to be so so far ahead ahead of us. I don't know. Obviously, size is not always a direct uh, correlation with technology or ability. The Defiant. In... Are you saying oh, yeah. size doesn't matter? <laughs> a good saying size doesn't matter. Is that official now? 
Hey, the Jeradex is pretty strong as well, but can be defeated by two, two Defiance and Akira, so smaller ships win out against that size. Just want mm. to tell you that. Now, it's fine to say it's huge, and it is meant to be huge, but when you create a big ship in the first place, the Daedalus, and we'll talk, we've, we've, we'll have do an episode on that, I'm sure, with scale, and we know the scale, thanks to this. You know, it's already a big ship in, in the Trek universe. This is the correct scale with these two ships. To create a bigger, bigger ship, you, you have to ignore how big the first thing is, Mm. To then create this ginormous secondary thing, but then if you look at it, if you then reverse engineer and look at it compared to say Constitution class, which we know is a five-year explorer, big crew, does everything, and then compare it to a Lantian ship, which, you know, more technology, sure, yeah. But what the hell is all this space for? It doesn't actually work in terms of real life necessarily, but it is that visual jump. So how how would you justify the humongous size i mean it is difficult to to put a finger on what any of this internal space could be i mean when we, we see the diagrams that they released and they would have you believe that everything from the forward section of the of the like the splayed out bit at the back with the engines everything from the front of them to the back of the bulky section where like all the whole that whole cylinder with the fins is all a power generator just a, just a goliath power generator hmm. and it's like that that's a that that seems like it'd be pretty powerful i mean we see these things, there's information to suggest that they're pretty great, and then you can plug ZPMs into them and they're even better, and, yeah. and you put more ZPMs into them and they're even better, and then and we see uh, we see them operate with a full set of zero-point modules, plus whatever is being produced by that, like, a, we've got a power generator that's the size of a Sovereign-class starship on this thing, and uh, and that's that's got to be a lot of energy, and, and you can see they suddenly start using the... Uh, the point defense pulse cannon things to, to blow up traveler generational ships and stuff and and it's really juiced it up uh, but now, i mean you've got that section at least now are you, are you, are you saying i can't remember specifically this, this was a while ago you're saying that each the i'm just you're referring to the alteran like the the uh the asuran the, were they all do they all have a zpm on that was was that what you were saying yes they we do know uh, that they're all loaded completely with zero point modules those ships and yet they were defeated so easily that's depressing yeah, and none of them use drones. Do they? I don't know why they don't use they drones. They do, the but not very much. And it's pitiful how few they use. Mm. Anyway, that's a whole that's a whole episode we can do on yeah. that stupid battle. It's amazing, but also very stupid. <laughs> very very stupid. Right. Well, okay. So, but yeah, yeah, I mean, fi- the, ba- yeah. the bow section is very hard to justify. Like uh, from the bulk, because I mean that central bit with the with the two prongs. Apparently, that whole sticking out bit on the on the on the port side is or the starboard side sorry is an, a sensor array which is a hell of a big sensor array see i yeah. can i can buy that though because in stargate we talked about this in, in the episode we just had it's all about subspace you can send messages you can send through subspace so why don't you know, if this ship is gonna be that you know the other side of the galaxy or even past the galaxy maybe, maybe the ship also went back to the r galaxy to see the asgard occasionally maybe the mm. sensor if it's the top ship of the fleet why wouldn't they build sensor that can go either across the galaxy just easily you know, high def video 4k video Across the galaxy, or multiple <laughs> galaxies, why not? Do you want to I do mean, a live stream with the other four great races? Yeah, yeah, yeah 4K, oh, yeah, yeah. 3D. Yeah, I mean, have some conference calls occasionally. Get, get the furlings in on it. Yeah, well, well, exactly. You know, I mean, so I'm I'm not overly against that, but again, look at it in, in comparison. You know, that is almost the size, the length of the Dideridex, which is one of the biggest ships in Star Trek. Yeah, you know, th- this ship would be great to see against the Wraith, uh, not the Wraith, the uh, Whale Probe. <laughs> That'd be a fun. By, like, by the standards Hello. of the Star Trek universe, like this, this is a big ship by Stargate standards. But by Star Trek standards, this ship is Goliath. Yeah. This, yes. this is this is a monster of it. Like look, look, look in this comparison. I mean, the Der- the, the Derridex is is huge anyway. And and like, it when it when it was first brought in, it was one of the biggest things in the franchise. It was. Oh, it was, well, it was the biggest, basically. Yeah. Was basically. it definitely the biggest? Yeah. And I mean, obviously, obviously we don't count like the Whale Probe or Doomsday because they're not like, like Vija and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah. but biggest uh, ship of the line, at least, yeah. and this thing is just it just dwarfs it. It's 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 massive. Like, and yet it doesn't feel out of proportion, which tells you that it's it's such a huge scale. Mm. And even I, mean, I would love if the bridge which we see in the show was that is that dome. You know, I wish that was like two or three levels because it's a pretty big bridge. It's yeah, at it least is, yeah. you know twice, if not maybe four times the size of a galaxy bridge. So there is certainly some scale to it. And it's very very tall, but if it was multiple levels, hell of a budget thing. That would have given you the sense of, a, I mean, I think we mentioned this offline, a, a CIC more than a, a bridge, you know, yeah. a real command and control area. Because mm. again, fleet fleet command, we have no we have no precedent saying this is the standard ship of the of the ancient fleet. 
We have no, mm. we have no idea. All we ever saw was these two. And then I mean, that's the jumpers. only implication is that this is what the uh, Azurans chose to produce on mass, which would be and... the strongest ship, wouldn't it? Yeah. And there's, there's, no, there's no problem with building things quickly, so why not build the biggest thing in their in their in their ballpark? Mm. I can't wait to the, the Wraith Hive ship episode, Stuart, because this that's this is small compared to the Wraith Hive ship. Oh, the Wraith Hive ship is massive. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's insane. We saw the the head grabber, the the the, the mental grabber thing from the uh, that was like the only piece of Lantian technology we'd really seen, and it looks kind of chitinous and insectoid, the like the black, and it's yeah. like it wouldn't have been unreasonable for whoever was asked to design this to go, oh well, I guess everything the ancients built was black and an insect looking. Let's build a big black insect ship, and bad idea. Like this, this, this looks much better than than anything mm-hmm. that could have been produced by going down that path. Mm-hmm. And, and I think. And- and it is certainly, I think you're right at the start saying, you know, how how do you build something like this? We only have the Pearl Jumper, and, which is a fighter, which is theoretically a shuttle fighter, and the, the Atlantis city ship, which as far as we know is the only city ship. Later not, but that's yeah. the pinnacle of their civilization is this city. And it can't be either of these things. It's a warship. It doesn't fit any of those criteria. And it can't be like a city because a city it really is just buildings. There's, I mean, you can tell some stylistic elements they've pulled. You know, the shapes are much you know curvy and and, and hexagonal. Certainly, and, the interiors. Yes, yeah. certainly. But some of the shapes do certainly fit. But you know, pull jump. We see the later Asuran, probably ancient. You know, a uh, little frigate that has those pull out arms like the pull jumper. So we know that aesthetic at least carries on to other ships. But how do you start the ball rolling? And I think, as you said, it's a really great design. Just as a design, it doesn't necessarily scream ancient. But no, we didn't know what they looked like. We didn't. We had no idea. So it's a good design on its own. So the size doesn't work. The crew number doesn't work for me, because you got four hundred and thirty people on the little Constitution class ship there, uh, and this one has what three hundred? You said. You said three to five. Yeah, that's what five. it says online. Yeah. But I do like the fact that if this is so drone, if this is, if this is a drone launcher, this is its primary function. You said that middle part at the back with the fins is basically all just power generation. Uh, for the engines, why not have the drone factory or levels of drone factories producing drones nonstop, also requiring a lot of power? I think then that works for me because there's a lot of factory space, and I think with the with that crew complement and stuff, then I then it starts to fall into to place for me. But as for if the, if there's not that kind of wasted well not wasted but like large factory space then i, I, I kind of lose the whole vibe of this being this big speaking i would like to see maybe you know the size of the connie in this scale chart to the edge of the Dederodex, maybe so like twice ish the size of the deadless i can see that being yeah. more realistic because it's like a big ship and it is still a big ship and definitely bigger than the Dederodex, just in pure room it's all real space, but not oversized like this. Although then again, you've got the shot with the Deadless in, in, in the show. But I think you can probably still justify that with how far it is away. I think you could probably still make that, that work. Yeah. Um, I mean, even the scales they've provided uh, in, you know, canon for the Deadless are um, weird. Like, it's already got the saying that the Odyssey is 25 meters longer. Like, I mean, that's a hell of an antenna to stick on the flagship or something. 25 <laughs> meters. Like, like, it's obviously supposed to be the same class. Like, yes. you know. Well, welcome to the world of Stargate. Uh, it, 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 it's, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll work it out, guys. This is what we do here on Track Yards and Fleet Yards, and this is obviously Fleet Yards, but I want to thank Daniel for jumping on, letting us know his opinions, and sort of doing a part two to his space talk, which you should all, should all check out and find out all the canonical details. When we do our episode, we'll try and do a few theories and things, maybe bring you on again, Daniel, to, to, to go through some stuff. But Stuart, what was your last thought on the, on the Aurora class, and then Daniel, your last thought on the Aurora class, and then Samuel, your last thought on the Aurora class. Wait, that's me. Okay. <laughs> As I said, it's a cool-looking ship. I love the color scheme. I it, It's not the standard brick-in-space co- colored gray <laughs> for me. Uh, they've changed it up and made it look very unique. Uh, I love the, the detailing and the shape of the, the rear part, the engine compartment. Yeah. Again, not just a big, blocky engine compartment, as we're used to seeing in other sci-fi franchises. So, And the pro- the size does bother me. We've already discussed that, but it can be worked out. I think I think they should have factories building drones in there, and we're all good then. So plus yeah. all, all the all the storage for all the equipment required to do that, all the raw materials, and then the finished drone yeah. storage. I think you can definitely account for all that space if it's that size. So I think it's great, and that's where I stand. Yeah, I mean, my opinion is much the same as Stuart's. I think uh, like everything that I said about the choice of style as opposed to making it look wacky and alien was was great. And if they were to add one piece of canon to this thing, and it was to incorporate that kind of factory ship 
uh, automation system to, for all that space, that would be a perfect way to both combine the standard approach of the ancients with eliminating all of this potentially unnecessary space that we've got going on. It's already so uh, logical within the within the ethic of the Lantians. It's a def it's a really well shielded, really well defended, covered in point defense platform for throwing drones at people. And that's 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 what it's for. Like we, we fight this way, and this ship is for that purpose. And it, it, it the design speaks to that perfectly. If they had loads of automation in the back, it'd make perfect sense. It really would. My closing thought is: we need to see more ancient ships. Why can't they do a third, a fourth spin-off? You know, in the ancient war, we see all different classes, I and mean, you can retrofit so many cool designs off this. I would love to have seen that. Would have been so yeah. nice. I, I'm sad I'd love to see literally any more Stargate that isn't made by Roland Emmerich. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we but could we've have got a some... series about Walter Harriman. That'll do. He would. He would totally take. He'd totally take the paycheck, and he'd totally make the joke about the chair. But yeah, <laughs> uh, I, I, I love most of the ships from Stargate. I think they've really excellent designs. I can't wait to look at more ships, and there might be some really interesting surprises on the horizon for you guys about that. So once again, thank you to Daniel. Uh, no thank problem. you to thank you to thanks Stuart. Stuart. Thanks, thanks, Stuart. Dick, thanks, thanks, Daniel. Nice seeing you again. And, and any, any of you who came over here from my video, please subscribe to Trek Yards. More stuff like this coming, and the stuff they've already made is great. So check it all out. Dive into all their videos. Very good stuff. And we're looking right. forward to more collaboration videos with you, Daniel. So thank you for joining us again. So. And if you like this format, let us know, because Daniel knows a lot about all the other sci-fi universes as well. There's so many things we could talk about. But until next time, next Fleet Yards, next week on Trek Yards, this is Commander Coggins. And Captain Foley. And I'm Daniel from Space Dock. See you next time, guys. Bye, everybody. Bye.